I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversation. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. The majority of older adults over the age of 65 are taking 15 to 18 medications annually. This can lead to an increase in hospitalization, but it also has a cost of nearly $21 billion annually. My guest today is Dr. Delon Canterbury. He is the founder of Geriatrics. It's a telehealth concierge consulting service that focuses on helping overwhelmed caregivers and clinicians stop their loved ones from being over-medicated. Dr. Canterbury uses genetic drug screening, deprescribing, and health cost-saving strategies. Strategies. Dr. Delon Canterbury is a board certified geriatric pharmacist. As we will hear him share, one of the biggest challenges was when his family experienced the decline of his grandmother and realizing that medication played a role. He never wanted to see his patients or his parents struggling as much as his grandmother did. That is when geriatrics was founded. Having seen many people suffering from being over medicated, We talk about his story and his advocacy in pharmacology, the important change that needs to happen in our healthcare industry, and what the concerns are with geriatric pharmacology at the moment, how we can support family caregivers, what does over-medication mean and what we should look for, how to understand what the root cause of some of these issues are, and where do we start in deprescribing? What are important questions to ask ourselves and our pharmacists? How he is hopeful and what he has seen in the growing improvement in this space, and how Dr. Canterbury supports professionals, families, and older adults with his holistic and evidence-based approach. Here is my interview with Dr. Delon Canterbury. Hello, Delon. We meet again. How are you? I'm fantastic. What is going on, Nicole? How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's so fun to see your face again. We were able to meet at the Care Colloquium, which Mm -hmm. was so great to have that introduction. How was that experience for you? What did you think about it all? Oh, man, it was so fun. Um, And I mean, inspiring, invigorating. I came back with a fresh of ideas for my business and how to better support our caregivers. But really the best part was just seeing everyone's passion, you know, meeting people like you, meeting Kim Wider and her crew and, and seeing the impact and the stories that we all relate to uh, really just resonated. And it just gave me that spark to keep pushing for our caregivers and being that advocate as a pharmacist. Yeah, it's so good. And I was introduced to what you do, which was new for me, actually. I wasn't aware that that expertise was available, which was so cool that you're able to like come alongside those families, older adults, practitioners. I loved when we, um, there's a group of us that went out to dinner and you had said to like all of us, which I thought was super cool, like what is your need and how I can support you? And we all kind of went around and shared that. That just, Mm -hmm. you know, enlightens us and I think shares what that whole experience was like. Okay, we're in it together. We're going to support each other. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, that's, that's why we're still close, right? Mm-hmm. That's why we're still in touch from <laughs> exactly. really seeing that, you know, caregiving uh, along with what we're doing as, as entrepreneurs, it, it takes a village. It takes a community of people um, to help us get to those goals, help support each other um, and really be there just to listen emotionally too. You know, we may be going through some stuff and it's good to have people impact that with. So yeah, I think that's the importance of connection. Me too. It's so why get up in the morning, right? To have that community and that connection and to be able to share that with everybody else. So thank you. Thank you for being yeah, here. You sure. have a personal story with what brought you into advocacy mm-hmm. in this realm. Can you share with us what that was for you? Yeah, most definitely. So for those who don't know, I am a, a, a pharmacist and founder of Geriatrics. And so we are a telehealth concierge pharmacist service and we help caregivers and families 
figure out what the problems are with their loved one's medication lists. And we're able to advocate on a way that empowers providers and the families to make sound decisions when they're in a bind or maybe looking at forcing someone into a nursing home or just at their wit's end. And so for me, I got into this space realizing that pharmacists can do so, so much with our education and, and empowering people that um, a lot of it started from um, having my own grandmother who was suffering from mild dementia and being in a nursing or assisted living facility in, in Brooklyn, where she inevitably was prescribed one prescription and it was an antipsychotic, it was completely inappropriate and it was meant honestly to chemically knock my grandmother out. And so it took us a number of months. Um, in fact, it got so bad with her symptoms. She was irritable, angry, wandering, I really couldn't remember who her family members were. Uh, it got so bad with her behavioral symptoms that she ended up being kicked out of the nursing home. Right. It, it yeah, makes no sense. And so here we are with my parents. I was a college student. I wasn't a pharmacist yet. Having to move her from New York to Atlanta, find a nursing home, find a caregiver, find home health people, child proof the home because she kept wandering. Just a lot of expense and a lot of stress. And we eventually found out it, after four months of struggling that it was the prescription. It was the one pill. And it took one pharmacist at, at a Rite Aid to say, I think this is the cause of your problem. She took the extra time to, to advocate, not just refill a prescription like we always do, or like I, like I used to do as a pharmacist in retail. Um, but it was her advocacy that really sparked a fire in me in not just becoming a pharmacist, but in having a voice for our seniors. So I'm like, how many people almost fall through the cracks? How many people don't have that voice? You know, how many people don't even know who to ask? So I, I felt it upon myself to make the caregiver the forefront of geriatrics and give people that tool and that peace of mind so they can have that clarity. Yeah. And your experience with that gave you the heart to then want to serve other people, especially older adults and more of the minority community. Is that correct? Because that is who I feel like falls through the cracks and doesn't have the voice to say, hey, this isn't this isn't right. Here's what I need. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a black male a pharmacist and the, the numbers are staggering. You know, there, there actually are studies that show that more Black and Latino patients that fall under my grandma's um, health conditions are actually overprescribed inappropriate antipsychotics like that. So to your point, not only in this dementia space, but in general, it's it's a much harder road. And, and if you don't have a communicative uh, provider that can relate to the patient, you're going to miss certain conditions or social barriers. And we already have a difficulty navigating as a whole. Uh, but those disparities uh, lead to worse outcomes. Um, and so that's that's a part of my mission as well, is being that voice and giving people that peace of mind from a trusted messenger. Which is what we need. There's such important change, I feel, that has to happen in healthcare. And you're mm -hmm. being able to do that and, and make change and create action and giving people tools of what we can speak up about. And... I think also it's that encouragement to think really critically about our care and medications is a big part of that. How much pharmacology do our medical professionals currently have right now? What does that look like? <laughs> uh, Not enough, right? It's, it's, it's fairly laughable. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fairly laughable, uh, you know, and it's no slight to the or to our clinicians or prescribers. But there is a segment of pharmacology required for med students and to become a doctor. And, and, and that usually looks like about six weeks, right? Like about six weeks. And then you get a little more training as you get into your field. But honestly, you end up kind of just getting comfortable with your favorite drugs to use. And that isn't exactly appropriate for people with different uh, genetic backgrounds, different uh, side effect profiles, different age, because the way we um, um, break down drugs changes the older we get. And so using your favorites isn't going to always work. And this is why pharmacists are the caregiver's secret weapon, because we literally have a doctorate in understanding the pharmacology, understanding the side effects, 
understanding the crazy kinetics that these drugs do, and then understanding those drug interactions that may affect care. So it's, it's unfortunately lacking, and we have a system that is very reactive. It, the patient has to say, hey, I have a side effect, versus how about we reduce that harm first before we prescribe something? So it's we're doing things a bit inefficiently. And that's why pharmacists are so valuable, but we don't have a system that supports us to do what we can do as best as we can do. Yeah. So in general, what are the big concerns and like the landscape of geriatric pharmacology right now? Good question. So here's the reality. You know, we have a growing aging uh, landscape that's living longer and um, I guess relatively healthier since they're staying alive but we don't have enough care providers to take care of them. And we don't even have enough geriatric doctors that exist. They're about 1% of the medical workforce. And frankly, it's about the same for pharmacists. About 1% are geriatric trained. So when you have more and more people aging and living longer, they're going to likely have more, guess what, caregiver demands. They're going to have more family looking out for them because they're living longer. And so those caregivers are going to need more time, more money, and energy to figure out how to make sure granny is good. And in that issue, uh, we have a world where we're seeing more and more people on more and more medications. That's a problem. And so we're not thinking, hey, you've been on this for 20 years. Maybe we should stop. Or maybe grandma really can't take 25 pills. What can we do about getting her down to 10 or, or five? And so when we have less people addressing that issue, you're going to have more harm. You're going to have more hospital visits. You're going to have more side effects. You're going to have more falls. You're going to have more caregiver burnout because you're managing all that stuff. You're going to have more caregivers becoming the future aging generation (laughs) because they're burned out from all their chronic conditions from taking care of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So there's a cyclical issue here that I feel our government is failing to truly address. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we got covid knocking out the labor shortages here. And this is all compounding an issue that leads to, unfortunately, who is advocating? Who is talking about these issues? Who's talking about the drugs? And so that's why I created Geriatrics, was to give that voice, but to give anyone the power of knowing, hey, this is probably why your your, your loved ones are falling. This Mm -hmm. is why their blood pressures are so low or their blood sugars are uncontrolled. We need to have that specificity mm-hmm. and, and we got to use pharmacists. This is our gift. So that's why I created a business model around just simply serving, go to the community, go to the churches. Mm-hmm. And that's why we met at the caregiver conference yeah. because it, it aligns with our, our, with our mission. And I feel pharmacists are, and in fact, a lot of healthcare professionals are missing out on a boat on the way we can really use patient advocacy and harness that to empower, yeah. to empower others. Absolutely. And giving us permission to ask the question. I think at times we think, okay, if doctor prescribes something, we need to do that or just accept it and not necessarily have to like really play an investigator role, right? Or be as even as a family member looking at that and respectfully pushing back or asking some of those questions and and understanding. As caregivers too, we are not experts in everything. And so to expect that we're going to know every detail about medication and and what and how that impacts our loved one is obviously, obviously not not feasible. What's the impact on whether it's um, a financial or even health-wise, what's the impact due to mismedication management? It is egregious, Nicole. In, in America alone, we have about 750 seniors that are sent to the hospital because of that very same issue, mismanaged medication. So 750 every day. Wow. Um, that, that's a lot, that's a lot. And, you know for for a lot uh, and, and the truth is we as citizens are the ones paying through our taxes we're paying medicare we're paying for these hospital visits that our patients can't afford and it's not only a cost prohibitive for our current healthcare model but it's terrible for the family right who wants to have a prescription refill that you're paying for and then give it to your loved one and it leads to them being in the hospital like that's backwards. So not only is there a burnout on the familial end, but the doctors get dinged because they're not doing their job or they're, they don't get reimbursed or the star measures or whatever that, that their health systems uh, grade them on. 
But if they get dinged, you know, now they get a double hit. And again, they don't even have the time to see all these people. So there, there's a cost associated. Of course, we know that there's overall quality of life. There's increased mortality and death, morbidity for our actual patients. Of course, there's more stress. And honestly, there's just lack of fulfillment as a healthcare provider because we're tired of the system sucking. Like, yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> totally. We're tired of this. Yeah. We're so tired. Yeah. And we want to do more, but a lot of our hands are tied because the system just keeps us trapped or confined. So when you talk about the implications, we waste about $530 billion a year from mismanagementications. It's a devastating. In the US. Yeah. That's just the U.S. Like, just the U.S. The World Health Organization has ranked mm. medication harm as the top three threat to human existence. Like, wow. Wow. Yeah. It's, or, I think it's in the top 10, but I'm pretty sure yeah. it's the third one. But it's Incredible. the top 10, but it's number three. So it's a huge issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and honestly, America's behind on the de-prescribing efforts, mm-hmm. and we're just starting to wake up a little bit more to it, but Australia, Canada, mm-hmm. Europe, they've been doing it for decades, mm-hmm. and we're just starting to wake up. So, yeah, you know, I have hope, but the costs are, are pretty profound. Yeah. Oh, my word. Devastatingly. Yeah. Why are we behind? Why is everyone else ahead of us? I don't know. Oh, yeah, man. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, we're, there, there's a number of reasons. You know, I'm not going to blame it all on the system, but we, you know, we're, we're, as Americans, we uh, we want things fast. We want things now. So we think a pill is the fast and now solution instead of usually trying to get to the, the root cause of our, you know, of our concerns, right? So a lot of meds are honestly Band-Aids. And because of that mindset, we come in, we see a commercial. Oh, I want that energy pill. Oh, I want that happy pill. <clears throat> instead of doing some of the the shadow work or the holistic work or whatever it takes, whether it's exercise, diet, nutrition, thinking you don't have the power to change your course in your health is a cost. And so I think in a way we're in this matrix, we're kind of brainwashing the thinking we have to have all these meds. And I'm again, not anti-medicine. I'm just painting the picture of our landscape. So when you have people coming in, hey doc, I saw this new pill, I want it. The doc's like, well, if you want it, whatever. I, I need to keep my my star ratings up. And, you know, if I get a check from pharma, that's fine too. But if not, whatever. The patient wants it, I want them happy. So there's a cyclical, I might barely have the time to do all the right stuff. There's even a lack of hope in providers thinking patients can change their health. So they just say, let's just give you a pill because I assume you're not going to do it anyway. And that's what the problem is. We just think reactively instead of looking at the whole person and looking at their social needs, their community needs and other barriers that affect your care. Yeah. We're not giving people enough credit either that there's like that change possible, you know? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. We're not. Okay. So in talking today about over-medication and de-prescribing, what does that term over-medication mean? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting, um, but essentially it could be the excessive use of, you know, clinical diagnostic testing, or even, of course, over-medicating here. It could be a, a too high of a dose. It could be an inappropriate medication for someone's health conditions. It could be a genetic drug interaction that we may not know unless a genetic test is done, which we offer. So overprescribing really is just the overuse of meds that may no longer be appropriate for someone uh, over 65. And so we tend to get a little pause when people are taking more than five medications. So usually if you keep increasing by fives or 10, 15, 20, there's a significant percentage increase of harm in that loved one. So you know, it's overprescribing, they say can have a negative connotation because it puts all the blame on the doctor, but it, it really just paints the picture of someone just being on too many meds. Uh, and sometimes they all may have been appropriate at some point, but is it appropriate now? And that's the question I want everyone to leave is you need to be questioning everything. Like it doesn't matter how long it, you need to be wondering what can we do holistically to get you off? If I'm on six blood pressure meds and I've been controlled for 10 years, can we take off one or two? That's the type of dialogue we're trying to have. And and that's that's why I feel over-prescribing is it can be addressed not just from the provider end, but from the caregiver end too. 
Yeah. And to your point, too, as you were talking about, because you have that advanced degree in geriatric pharmacy. And right. as we age, our bodies change. And so what might have been our norm how many years ago isn't possibly going to be working right. well with our bodies as we get older. And so to like to keep that open all the mm-hmm. time, what do we look for if we like within our loved ones that there could mm-hmm. be over medication happening? Like what types of signs are we trying to find? Yeah, no, I love it. You know, really it's going to first know your, your, your loved one's body language and, and there's just their day to day, right? Know their baseline, know what they're normally like. And then look for any changes in that. And it could be as subtle as an appetite change. It could be being more constipated than usual. Um, It could be a mood swings, lack of appetite. It could be increased falls. It could be not being responsive in conversation, like being over sedated, being more tired. So really it's, it can be literally any change you see physically or mentally uh, in your spouse. Uh, It could be how they may communicate, you know, it could be a change there. It could be a medication that could be causing that. So one thing I I don't want people to fall victim to is thinking that just having some memory lapses is a, you know, is a sign of aging. Like it's, it's not like you got to make sure we're ruling out if something's causing that, or if there may be a health condition that's presenting. Um, So again, I think that comes down to knowing your baseline, knowing your loved ones, what's kind of normal, and then if it's something that if you're urinating 20 times a day and that's normal, that's not exactly normal. You know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> yeah. don't just write it off as normal, right. but just question, you know, if they, and then ask them, you know, how are you feeling? Like, you know, when they take each pill, do they see a difference? Do they feel anything? If it's in a time of day, do they wake up still feeling groggy? You know, they're just subtle things to it. And then there's things that are just obvious, like falls, of course, or just difficulty remembering where they are, constipation, diarrhea, any, really any change can be attributed to a medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not just accepting that decline is normal, right? It's looking and being curious about what's happening. When we know, I feel like too, we know, like you were saying, when you know your loved one and you know what, what their personality is like and how they interact, we can pick up on those, mm-hmm. on those small changes. How sure. do we start? Like where do we begin even making decisions about deprescribing? What does that look yeah. like? And, and why do we do it? Like, why is that so important? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, The most important thing in starting this process is getting an accurate and up-to-date medication list. So you want to have everything listed. I don't mean the stuff they've been hoarding in their closet for five years. (laughs) You want to know everything they're actually taking Mm -hmm. or what they're supposed to be taking. um, And then include all of the -the over-the-counter stuff. Do not underestimate natural products, herbals, vitamins, and other over-the-counter meds. They have tons of drug interactions. So you have to let all of them be known to your primary care provider or your community pharmacist. So the first thing, get an accurate med list, keep it somewhere handy, keep it up to date, whether it's in a wallet or uh, an ongoing document you have uh, digitally um, or in a purse, it doesn't matter, but just keep it handy and keep it accurate. And then you're going to want to look for, and then this is where you're going to want to consult an expert like myself, um, or it could be a community pharmacist or your doctor, but you want to see if what they have on their records are even the same, because I'm going to guarantee you a lot of the meds are not accurate on the health system side. Uh, like That's true. Uh, I just fact, experienced that. I was like, I'm not taking that. And <laughs> they had an allergy and I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's not accurate. <laughs> It's not accurate and don't like go off like a health systems brand name. It's all the same problem. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. there's just a a problem with electronic health records. So you want to make sure the med list is updated on the provider end. And then you're going to want to really talk through are all these things needed? And you can do that with your community pharmacist to just do a deep dive if you have a relationship with them. And of course, you can send a message in the e-chart with your medical PCP and Uh, What a lot of people don't know is um, people on Medicare qualify for annual wellness visits, right? And a part of your annual wellness visit is to have a thorough medication review done by your provider. And I don't mean a 
Are you still taking this? Yes, 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 no. Okay, that's not a med review. A med review is a deep dive into each and every drug, each and every dose, each and every health condition that is supposed to be treating. So it needs to be thorough. And it is ideal to have it done with a pharmacist, but you know your provider can do that too. And I think the next step is, as we look for potential inappropriate meds, is to continuously rinse and repeat. We're gonna do this every time, every three to six months that you see your doctor, you're gonna send messages and we're gonna continuously keep asking, what can we do to get them off this X, Y, Z? indefinitely until you're down to a really low number. There's the term polypharmacy. Where does that live within the conversation we're having today? What does that mean? Yeah, it's almost synonymous um, mm -hmm. with overprescribing, but okay. polypharmacy is, um, essentially defined in the literature as taking five or more medications. And it could be someone maybe using two different pharmacies and they may not realize that there's an interaction and in one pharmacy drug and another. It could be having someone who's on multiple prescribers, right? And five of them are writing stuff that interact and they don't know what the other people are writing. It could be you self-medicating and not realizing your herbals and ibuprofen are interacting with your blood pressure meds or your blood thinners. So polypharmacy can kind of encompass a lot of those scenarios, but generally it's defined as taking five or more meds. Uh, and, the, and this is in the senior population. It can happen in older and younger adults, but specifically in seniors, they're just more sensitive to those harms. So that's why it's um, becoming more of a, a topic of interest. Yeah, because I hear we hear the term and it's just nice to understand the framework around it because you're right, it does get kind of intermixed in the over medication. I believe I heard you because your social media, if people don't follow you, they need to because you do <laughs> so, you share so much good info. And I think I remember you referencing, you know, like if you, when you look at your medications, if you do not really need this to live to like evaluate mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and to go through mm -hmm. and ask yourself questions about what we're on and why because i think sometimes like there's i mean i think i have a medication i've just had it prescribed for i don't know how many years but do i really really mm -hmm. need it maybe not <laughs> you know yeah. yeah 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 so so there's a method called came out of the va and it's a mnemonic called a vione V-I-O-N-E, and essentially it, it's like a shorthand for assessing which meds are truly necessary. And so vi V stands for vital, I is like important, meaning yeah, it's important for your quality of life, but not like vital to live. O is like, is the medication optional? N is um like, is it not necessary, right? And then E is basically making sure every medication you're on has an appropriate health condition. And so this came out from the VA um, and they're playing with a couple of models of putting this into more community hands. And that's what I do is I teach this to my clinicians who, who uh, work with me in my deep prescribing accelerator program. Uh, we train people how to use this mnemonic to put it in their communities. And so I encourage everyone to just essentially go through each med and, and ask, is this vital for me to live? And is it important for my quality of life? If it's not either of those two, it's maybe worth having a conversation around. Yeah. What medications that we encounter should raise concern for the majority of the population or should raise concern for us? Are some more detrimental to us than others? Yeah, um, absolutely. We know that there's a huge opioid epidemic going on, so those should not necessarily be red flags, but uh, they are associated with a lot of harm in, in an aging population, and they do have an addictive potential. It does not mean if you're in pain and you need a pain med that you can't take it. You just want to be aware that it does have a possibility of leading to substance abuse, or it's associated with that. It does not mean everyone who takes an opioid is an addict. That's not true. So there is a lot of stigma with that, particularly in seniors. I'm a concern because one, there are better options to treat people. And two, you're you're a senior. Like you, it doesn't mean you're not in pain. It just means there, there are better things to use. And uh, opioids are generally meant to be used acutely, like for short term. They're not truly meant for chronic use. And in fact, they're not really studied unless we're talking like cancer patients or something or something really uh, extreme in that in that regard. And so the efficacy isn't nearly there. 
And the longer you're on it, the more likely you'll be dependent. And that's where some harms come. Um, another big one are uh, sleep aid medications or anxiety meds. So the, the benzodiazepines. So that's where like Xanax, clonazepam, alprazolam. And a lot of these I'm speaking from the senior lens, not just the general population. So those are also associated with the uh, causing um, respiratory failure, breathing issues, slowing your heart. They're associated with increased car accidents in seniors. So, and of course, falls uh, and fractures. So those are on, oftentimes, people have been on them for years, almost decades, uh, because they were once used for anxiety or occasionally used for sleep, and now they've created a dependence on it. They're pretty hard to get off. They're, they're hard to de-prescribe. Um, it does take a lot of time, but it is doable. It's, uh, it just takes a lot of um, supervision. And that's not, that's not something you could stop cold turkey. You have to have a provider oversee that, or you can um, cause seizures for yourself. So benzos and opioids are probably the big no-nos. I also try to avoid the use of NSAIDs in a lot of our older populations. So those are drugs like ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, over-the-counter or prescription. And they have just a ton of side effects and interactions, particularly with uh, blood pressure meds, uh, blood thinning meds. They really upset the stomach. They can increase internal bleeding. So, and they really do interact with a lot of herbal stuff too. So you just want to be careful with those. And if you use them, use them for short term. If you're finding yourself using them all the time, then we're going to want to look for ways to really better manage your, your pain. Um, so NSAIDs, which stand for in non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but basically your ibuprofen, Aleve, in some instances, BC goodies powder is an NSAID, like it's like a high dose aspirin and aspirin is technically kind of an NSAID, but even the, the use of baby aspirin has fallen into question now for the common person who's like, oh, I'll just use it for my heart. Like, no, that those, that data is gone. You don't need to do that unless you have been told you need this, like, because you had a stroke or heart attack or something, something more specific. So uh, those meds all can increase the risk of internal stomach bleeds, which is why, um, and they can also increase stroke and cardiovascular events or heart attack. So that's why not aspirin, but the NSAIDs like ibuprofen. So that's why we try to avoid those. There are also a couple, there are certain blood pressure medications that can really make people very tired. They could slow the heart rate down. So they wake up kind of feeling lack of energy or difficulty breathing. So those are, they're known as beta blockers. Um, and they're really sensitive in our seniors. So that's like metoprolol. Yeah, that's the main one that kind of comes to mind. But there are a number of drugs. But I say the ones that give me pause are those pain and sleep ones. And then for me, any antipsychotic or antidepressant is something you want to be very careful with. I don't like antipsychotics in elderly, generally, and it's usually inappropriate. And it's what knocked my grandmother out. So it's why I, you know, always tout that. And so if you see those Seroquils or Abilify or any other family in there, uh, you want to question why they're on it and yeah. if you can slowly taper it. Yeah. And in senior living communities, they're, in, especially in memory care with dementia residents, yeah there is a higher prevalence, I believe, of, I've looked at medical charts of my residents, and it is that important that we use alternative methods and ways to yeah. work with some of those dynamics versus just that first reaction is, I'm going to prescribe something. So, yeah, exactly. it's important to be critical about it. Um, you had also mentioned that the aging population is, or older adults, are the highest consumer of over-the-counter. And <laughs> um, is that it? Did I get that right? Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so uh, they're take they're self-medicating. They're using um, a lot of those products as well. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're about 14% of the population. And they consume about 33% of um, all over-the-counter products in our country. So there is a lot of self-medication. And, you know, this population doesn't want to, you know, bother the doctor, quote-unquote. So they, they self-medicate and try to treat themselves. So, yeah, a lot of uh, those products that seem to be natural or from the earth aren't exactly always safe. 
So you want to make sure you are getting a quality product if you are, but they do interact and, you know, the marketing is quite unregulated in that world. So they're going to do anything that they can legally to deceive you to think it'll work. Like I would get so many questions about, you know, Prevagen and, and preserving memory. And it's like, no, it's, it's not going to do much for you. And it's expensive. And there was an association of having strokes with it. <laughs> so they had to like take it off the market and reformulate it uh, because of that issue. So you, you just want to always just ask your pharmacist if this is truly going to work for me before you make a kind of purchase like that. And then try to see if it interacts with anything on your medication list on your profile. That's good advice. How are you hopeful and what are you seeing as growing improvement in this space? Yeah, so I my mission is to make de-prescribing synonymous with pharmacists. And so I pride myself on leaving a, leading a movement of de-prescribing advocates. Um, uh, we, you know, we've got social workers, gerontologists, pharmacists, nurses, and doctors who are leaving the fold and finding new ways to treat people a bit holistically. So I'm hopeful because I see it. I, I see tons of different people uh, creating their own niche and, and really serving people in a non-traditional way. So with further education, uh, will lead to further, you know, community questioning about it. And then there'll be more, there'll be more policy change down the road. And we have some policies that are already changing. We've got um, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, which makes the, basically the measures for nursing homes and, and these facilities. Yeah. I remember in those meetings and we'd go through our QI meetings <laughs> where yeah. we'd look at medications, right? And evaluate and all. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good to hear. Yeah. So yeah, they're now passing laws or policy to track de-prescribing efforts for benzodiazepines and for insulin, uh, which sometimes is associated with falls or low sugar, which can lead to hospitalization. So they're looking for ways now in policy. So I am very hopeful because if they're making that standard, we're going to see more of the health systems follow suit. You are starting a movement and it's been fun to see how that has grown, you know, just witnessing from the outside. I can definitely sense that there's that momentum. So I'm super excited for you and for our families and older adults and professionals. I mean, everybody involved and you work with people in different ways, right? You've got the professional side and I want you to share about that. And then I also want you to share how you work with families and older adults and caregivers, because I think it's all so important. Yeah. So, I mean, the meat and potatoes of what I do is um, I create the prescribing action plans for families who are worried about their loved one's meds. So I do a thorough med review. I look for opportunities to de-prescribe, and then I create an action plan based on your genes. So I do genetic testing for everyone uh, just to make sure there isn't anything genetically we may be missing. So in doing so, you get all this access um, and then you get an action plan that you can give to your provider and say, hey, we talked to Dr. Belon, geriatric pharmacist. This is his philosophy on where we think we can do these meds. And you essentially are now empowered and have the education around, you know, how to better use these meds. And if not, better use your lifestyle to get off some of these meds. So we really do things holistically. We look for those social barriers for care. We help people get enrolled with you know, grants and foundations to help with patient assistance for paying for some of those meds. Yeah. So we, we really go to bat for our patients one on one. And, and then now further, what I've done is I've taught or I'm teaching clinicians how to do what I do one on one for their businesses or for their care models. So I, I've created a course called the Deprescribing Accelerator. And it's a, a year long uh, access, but you're taught for three months and we get pioneers who are looking to roll out de-prescribing as a service, as a business model. And so in using these one-on-one -on -one consultations, it could be done through educating, you know, a nursing associating association or going to a nursing home or just going to your church or your community and talking about de-prescribing and leveraging your expertise. That is intended for pharmacists, nurses, doctors, social workers, um, PAs, and nurse providers, um, nurse practitioners. So, you know, that's more clinical focused, 
Um, but people are leaving with all the tools, all the tricks, all the secrets, all the things that other countries are doing to talk about de-prescribing and can leave with a monetizable revenue stream. So that's my passion is getting more people fired up about this. So again, that's why I'm hopeful because my cohorts, they're doing a the damn thing. They're doing the work. They're getting out of the community. They're serving. They're getting their passion back for their profession. <clears throat> so my model is, uh, you know, for patient caregivers and families, and it's for clinicians looking to do the same thing. But also I do education all the time. I do public speaking, education, I do webinars, I do talks. So there are a number of ways um, I've expanded my reach to empower people to make the right call. Yeah, you're the perfect person for it because your energy is so good and you connect well and you can share and articulate in ways that, you know, someone like myself who doesn't have that background, like I get it, I understand it. So I'm so thankful for your work and the holistic and evidence-based approach is vital and it's important as we, I think as a culture too, are wanting more alternative treatments and looking at the whole lifestyle and how we can be a effective in managing our our health and and all of it so this has been really fun thank you so much yeah my pleasure thank you thank you for listening today if you enjoyed our episode please subscribe and give us five stars (laughs) in all honesty we'd love to hear from you thank you so much for listening to our episode Mm -hmm.